Remember field trips and first dates? Generations have come to the Exploratorium to learn and play. Now we need your help, and every dollar you donate will be doubled. Sustain the wonder. you to our series conversations about landscape and tonight's program transitional landscapes at treasure island and ecological arts we are recording this tonight my name is susan schwarzenberg i'm the director of our environment programs in the bay observatory at the exploratorium in san francisco the exploratorium for those of you who may be tuning in from elsewhere is a museum of science art and human perception located on the san francisco waterfront the Bay Observatory is a windowed gallery on the Exploratorium campus. From our location, we have stunning views to San Francisco Bay and the city. We are equipped with exhibits, artworks, and programs exploring the built and natural environment and ways we can decipher our human impacts. We work with a range of professionals to do our work. Among our colleagues is our local Rama Teshaloni Association, who are working with us on a number of projects, but they are also advising us on a permanent land acknowledgement for the Exploratorium. We honor their initial stewardship of the land and waters of the San Francisco Peninsula and look forward to engaging their knowledge in our ongoing work. Please join us to take this moment to thank them and honor these lands and their generosity. Tonight's program is a joint effort of our environment group at the Exploratorium and our artist in residence program with my colleague Kirsten Bach. It is our pleasure to introduce the beginning of a dialogue with the San Francisco Arts Commission and Treasure Island Development Authority on their ambitious art program that will be developed within the new Treasure Island plan. The transformation of Treasure Island is a San Francisco driven project to evolve Treasure Island into an affordable and a sustainable new community. The program has been many years in the making with innovative design and engineering solutions, which you'll hear very much about in a few moments, to address community housing options, sustainability, and adaptation to sea level rise. The Exploratorium has been working with the Arts Commission and TIDA to consider the ways the practice of artists who work with long-term ecologies could influence and also contribute to the sustainability and adaptation goals of the landscape plan. We work with artists a lot at the Exploratorium, and we believe we, we, we can create through their knowledge and aesthetics ways to contribute to the resilience strategies and often help make them more visible and understandable to visitors. The program tonight is packed. And I think you'll see that um, we originally had planned it to be a symposium where we could dive deeper into the questions, have a tour of Treasure Island, really have the artists, scientists, and all of the participants uh, get into a deep dialogue. But instead, we decided to try it out with the public to see what kinds of thinking we have about development projects like this and the role that artists can play. So the program is in two sections. The first more focused on the regional sea level rise plan and an overview of the Treasure Island plan. The second on artistic approaches to sustainability and resilience. The first presentation will be by Jessica Fain, the planning director for the Bay Conservation and Development Commission, who will give us a regional perspective. She will turn it over to, to Faye Sten, director of the Treasure Island Development Authority, who will introduce the Treasure Island plan. And Faye will then hand it over to Kevin Conger, the principal of CMG Landscape Architecture, who's developed the landscape master plan. I will come back uh, after those presentations and introduce our speakers for part two on artistic approaches toward urban resilience. Please put your questions in the chat. We have colleagues out there who are fielding questions and will forward them to us and we'll take them all at the end of the program. Thank you. And I turn it over to Jessica. Thanks, Susan. Good evening, everyone. Um, I guess my slideshow should come up in a minute, but um, my name is Jessica Fain. I'm the planning director at BCDC, the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission. Like we're a California state agency uh, responsible for the uh, coastal management of San Francisco Bay, uh, its shoreline band and the Sassoon Marsh. And so I'm gonna share a little bit with you today about sea level rise, what's going on at a regional scale. Uh, so next slide. 
Um, the disclaimer, I'm a scientist. I'm not a scientist. I'm a planner. And so this uh, this is about as scientific as I get when I think about sea level rise and when I picture what's going on at a global scale. Uh, these two primary factors that are contributing to rising sea level, the, the melting of the ice sheets, as well as thermal expansions are contributing to this global uh, increase in mean uh, sea level. So that average water level is, is going up. And we know that's happening. Um, next slide. Uh, both here in the Bay, we've already seen uh, about eight inches of sea level rise over the past century. And that's projected to increase by 12 to 32 inches by mid-century. And as you get further out, those projections really uh, diverge, but could be at the ex more extreme ends over 10 feet by end of century. We also know that uh, here in the Bay Area, two thirds of the impacts of, of California will, will occur here in San Francisco Bay due to our really unique uh, ge ge geology, um, development history and kind of the, the, the landscape of the Bay. Next slide. Uh, so flooding uh, is already happening today and flooding comes from all sorts of different sources. And so when we at BCDC think about sea level rise, we also often use this approach called the total water level approach where you could imagine uh, temporary flooding today like storm surges or king tides uh, cause uh, that mean high water to rise. And over time, that, that water level will become a permanent inundation due to sea level rise. And so the flooding we're seeing today at places like the Embarcadero at, high, at King Tides can really show us what a permanent flooding could look like in the future. Next slide. And so at BCDC, we think a lot at the regional scale. What will sea level mean uh, across the entire nine county Bay area? And so when you uh, zoom out and you could read a 700 page report on this called the Adapting the Rising Tides uh, report. Um, but if, but um, when you really zoom out at, at, the, at the Bay scale, um, uh, 48 inches of sea level rise can have these kinds of impacts. Um, 5 million daily highway vehicle trips could be impacted. Uh, thousands of existing and planned uh, housing units and job, jobs could be impacted. Uh, we look specifically at our socially vulnerable residents and 28,000 socially vulnerable residents could be impacted as well as, you know, $20,000 of our natural areas, uh, wetlands, tidal lagoons, and marshes. Next slide. And if you're interested in exploring this more, I'd urge you to check out the uh, Bay Shoreline Flood Explorer where you can really zoom around and, and see what, what different levels of sea level rise might mean to your neighborhood or your community. Next slide. Um, so, BCDC was created about 50 years ago, and, and our primary concern at the time was a shrinking bay. There was filling going on, uh, areas being filled for development, and the Treasure Island project you'll be hearing about in a few minutes is an example of the kind of bay fill that we were experiencing. And so agencies such as BCDC were really set up, next slide, uh, to, to, to kind of combat that type of unregulated filling of the bay. Next slide. Um, but here we are in uh, 2021 and we are dealing with the growing bay. And so our challenges are very different. Our regulatory and our, our policy landscape is ex was built for a different time. And we're trying to figure out how do we how do we change that? How do we cope with a growing bay? Next slide. And so these are the kinds of issues that keep me up at night. Um, and uh, I'm grateful to spend my days thinking about this, trying to solve and find solutions for these kinds of problems. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done and innovation is needed. Um, these are complex problems and there's not single solutions. And so we know that we're gonna need solutions that are both natural as well as built. We'll need solutions that are from the bottom up, from the community, from the individual perspective, as well as from our governments at all scales. Uh, we know that we'll need actions that are collective uh, since we live in a series, you know, 100, 101 cities around a single bay, um, but also individual. Uh, and we know that these this will require both the projects, the physical interventions, but it's also largely a human problem. How do we work together to solve this? And so I'm excited to be part of today's discussion um, to hear about how artists can really contribute to this problem solving. Thank you. Hello. Hello, I'm um, president of the Treasure Island Development Authority, the public agency that is charged with overseeing the development of Treasure Island. And I'm happy to be here to 
discuss what we've been doing on Treasure Island and to give you a little bit of history. So Treasure Island commands a unique location in the San Francisco Bay. It's linked by the Bay Bridge to San Francisco and the East Bay with spectacular views of the city and the Golden Gate Bridge, Treasure Island is a jewel in the middle of the bay. What is the history of this island and what will its future be? Treasure Island was one of the most visible of President Franklin D. Roosevelt's WPA projects. It was constructed by the Army Corps of Engineers with mud dredged from the bay. Started in 1936, it was built in an era of engineering feats including the construction of the Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge. It was an age of, of optimism. The island served briefly as a landing base for the celebrated Pan Am fleet of Clipper seaplanes. In 1939, it became the site of a World's Fair, the Golden Gate International Exposition. For the World's Fair, a dazzling art deco magic city of towers, gardens, goddesses, statues, and light effects was created to showcase the rise of California and San Francisco as an economic, political, and cultural force in the Pacific. That age of optimism was cut short by World War II, and in 1941, Treasure Island was transformed into a naval station as part of the American military response to the war. The island became a major training and education center with four and a half million personnel shipped overseas from Treasure Island. Few residents of San Francisco set foot on the island in the 40 years that it was a military base. In 1997, the naval station was closed and Treasure Island reverted back to the city. The Navy was charged with the remediation and cleanup of the island, which has been a 24 year effort. So how do we go from the past to the future? This being San Francisco, there, was, there were 10 years of public discussion on how best to use the island. That 10 year effort culminated in a visionary award-winning master plan that the city adopted in 2011. The Treasure Island Development Authority is that agency overseeing its implementation. The plan for redevelopment calls for a spectacular new extension of San Francisco. It adds much needed housing, both affordable and market rate, over 8,000 units eventually over time. But the most remarkable feature of the plan and truly a gift to the public is the creation of more than 300 acres of parks, waterfront promenades, wetlands and wild natural areas, sport fields and an urban agricultural farm, all connected by bicycle lanes and big pedestrian trails. It will be the biggest addition to the city's park system since the creation of Golden Gate Park. The master plan has embraced sustainability as a guiding philosophy. It makes a commitment to a broad spectrum of housing affordability. It establishes a joyous public realm and it hopes to create an equitable and inclusive community. In closing, let me emphasize that the city has an unprecedented opportunity to incorporate artworks in our public spaces on Treasure Island. And Jill Manton will be describing our arts master plan for the island later on. We are surrounded by water, exposed to the wind and the sun, and we welcome artworks that will examine Treasure Island's unique setting, ecology, history, and the natural environment. I will turn this over to Kevin Conger to elaborate further on our extraordinary plans for Treasure Island. As a principal of the landscape architecture firm CMG, he has been a steward of this project for over two decades. Kevin. Thank you, Faye. Um, hello, everybody. Nice to be here virtually. Wish we were all in person. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and show you some slides. Um, I'm going to start out. Uh, well, I'm going to. I'm pr primarily going to talk about um, the the plan for Treasure Island and um, what the the physical plan looks like. And I'm going to focus then at the end a little bit on what I think are some of the potential areas for um, for um, ecology and art to come together. When we think about transitional landscapes, um, we don't often think of our urban waterfronts. 
as um, landscapes that are dynamic and, and in change. But in fact, um, much of the city and much of the urban waterfront in particular has been in almost constant change for 120 years. And is we are now actually in the midst of another major transformation um, that is gonna really radically change the way that the city um, relates to the waterfront in the next uh, 100 years to come. If we go back a little bit in time, looking at the San Francisco waterfront, we see that the, the level of change that has actually occurred on this waterfront, the yellow line shows the shoreline in the 1850s, and the red line shows the basically the waters, the city's edge now at the bay um, that was established from the late 1800s into the early 1900s as a seawall. And then all of that land behind the seawall was filled in to basically extend the city to the bay. And this shows that seawall under construction. You see these gentlemen um, standing on that and building, building it. It was basically just a rubble dike that was backfilled with soil. And then you see them constructing the piers going out into the bay. The reason they did this was to get access into deep water so ships could come up to San Francisco's waterfront and bring goods uh, into the city. It was basically the construction of a working waterfront. And in fact, that was the identity of the city for many, many years. It was a working industrial waterfront. You see here the um, cargo freight moving along in front of the ferry building. The train would move back and forth along the waterfront to take the cargo off of the ships and um, bring it into the city and into other places in um, California. Um, the, the working waterfront was also extended into the military industrial uses. There was major shipyards built down at Hunters Point on the south, um, built on the northern end in the Presidio. And also, of course, as Faye just described, uh, Treasure Island was an industrial working waterfront for military purposes. As a working waterfront with an industrial identity, it was also determined to be a good place to put a transit corridor. So the Embarcadero Freeway was built in the 1950s as a way to um, bring people through the city and create um, regional transportation that would allow people to more easily move through San Francisco. But there were three major events that really set off this transform transformation that we are now in the middle of. Uh, the first was the, um, oops, sorry, my screen's freezing for a second. Here we go. The first was the um, containerization of shipping, which made break bulk cargo, which is basically cargo that comes in smaller pieces that were removed by hand, it made break bulk cargo obsolete. And that containerized shipping moved over to Oakland and the port functions of the San Francisco waterfront were largely um, diminished. The second event was the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, which damaged the freeway and then led to the subsequent removal of the Embarcadero freeway in 1991, which really radically changed the relationship of the city to the waterfront. And the third major event was the decommissioning of the three major military bases along the San Francisco waterfront, the Presidio on the north, Hunters Point Shipyard on the south, and Treasure Island out in the middle, all of those happening in the 1990s. And that, as you can see on this map, has a really big impact with these three huge spaces that are now being transferred from the federal government to the city, those big circles, and the removal of the freeway becomes the catalyst for the renovation of the ferry building, the Giants bar par ballpark being built in, in 2000. Uh, and then importantly, Chrissy Field opening up, a 100 acre waterfront park opening up in um, 2001, really start to set in motion uh, this change that we're now midway through, which is the change of a industrial working waterfront to one that is largely about public access and nature. And that is basically the background and story that sets up um, the past, future, and transformation of Treasure Island, which is from a military industrial use to one that is of mixed use, a place to live for communities, and one that supports nature and the arts. The key uh, project principles, Faye just went over, but sustainability in a regional destination, very much to become part of San Francisco as a new neighborhood, and to have um, many community benefits, such as affordable housing and open space and um, those types of things. The building program, more specifically, is about 8,000 homes on Treasure Island and near Rubueta Island. Uh, there's a couple of hotels. There's a few hundred thousand square feet of retail to support the on-island residents so that it's a self-sufficient community and you don't need to leave the island to get your um, groceries and your other needs. 
uh, importantly, 300 acres of open space, new open space for the city of San Francisco. That will be the largest new contribution of open space since Golden Gate Park was established. And there are some historic buildings that are still remaining from the um, slides that Faye showed, which are being preserved and reused. The community is basically can be thought of as three districts. There's two residential districts, which are the large red boxes. And then there's one retail district, which is the, the uh, box with the pink, the zone with the pink box uh, around it there. It's a really large project, so it can't all get built at once. Um, it's being built over many phases. This area that is in pink is the first phase. Much of that is under construction now, and people will be living in most of that pink area within, some of it within um, a year, year and a half, and probably most of it will be built up within five years. And then it will move outward to um, the orange zone and then ultimately out into the blue zones. It will probably take another 15 years to build out all of Treasure Islands. But when it's done, it will be an extension of the city in a part of San Francisco, very visible from San Francisco itself. And of course, from Treasure Island, San Francisco is really amazingly um, right there. It's a stunning place if you have never been out there at night. It's a very compact um, development. It's quite urban, actually. Uh, the 8,000 units are primarily on 89 acres on Treasure Island. You can see some of the height of the towers. These are not what the buildings are going to look like. The, the architecture is not designed yet, but um, this gives you a sense of the density. Uh, that compact development is centered around transit, so it's very walkable to the ferry and buses. And by having the development be so compact, there's a tremendous amount of open space that is um, available for productive landscapes and public use. The plan itself, um, you can see the extent of the open space and you can see the developed areas, but you can also see this kind of eccentric diagonal city grid that is set up to respond to the microclimate. The wind comes in through the gate and sweeps across the island. So there's a series of wind rows that set up wind breaks uh, to make it a more comfortable public realm. Um, and that is primarily done to make it a transit oriented and commuter friendly um, place to live. It's a very short ferry ride across to San Francisco and the ferry comes in at an intermodal transit hub with the buses and um, and ferry together. And then from that, it's a very short walk to, out all, to access all the residential um, housing. Almost 15 minutes would be the maximum walk that it would take to get to the ferry building and it's supported by a pedestrian and bicycle network. It's, it's gonna be an amazing bike network. You can get around to all the parks, the schools, and all the major destinations without ever having to cross the street and deal with vehicles. And for the pedestrians, we have very high quality walkable streets um, that weren't wind their way through the neighborhoods so that we're really trying to reward those pedestrians. The parks are a diverse range of parks from sports parks to waterfront parks, to community parks, uh, all different types of parks. This is showing the waterfront park that comes in where the new ferry landing will be in front of the historic building one. Uh, that waterfront park extends to the north, the length of the island as a broad park from a bit more urban at one end to a bit more rustic and wild at the other as it gets out further to the north. There's a regenerative agricultural park in the middle of the island that's 20 acres that will produce food for the island and also for the Bay Area and begins to link together the water reuse and water treatment and waste coming out of the residential units to compost, to food production, and then kind of closing that loop back out. And in addition, there's an area called the wilds, which is um, primarily habitat and ecological functioning landscapes on Yerba Buena Island and also on the northern end of Treasure Island. Um, of course, we have a sea level rise adaptation plan, which is actually quite progressive. M many of the bars that you see here around the perimeter in green and orange will be set up to protect the island from mid-century sea level rise, but also be adaptable to um, uh, modify the parks to protect the island into further um, sea level rise. And there is a, a um, funding mechanism set up to pay for that. But um, I think really interestingly relevant for today's topic is the blue areas, which are actually being designed to welcome sea level rise and to flood to create new wetland areas to support further habitat and increase the wetlands in the San Francisco Bay with the idea that there is some opportunity in sea level rise to create new nature 
and improve the ecological well-being of the bay. So you, one can imagine when all of this is done um, that we would have this really new amazing waterfront that runs from the Presidio to the shipyard and extends out and around Treasure Island. And like Chrissy Field at the north, which did transform a military base to a park with thriving nature, we think that Treasure Island has the potential to do the same and will do so. And I'm very, very interested in hearing about how that can be informed and influenced through the lens of art. Thank you. Um, Susan, we will welcome you back. Thank you, uh, Jessica, Faye, and Kevin. Uh, we'll hold the questions, um, but certainly send them in. We'll, we'll take them a little bit later. Um, for our arts portion of the program, we will begin with Jill Manton from the San Francisco Arts Commission, who will introduce the Arts Master Plan for Treasure Island. She is the author of it, long-term uh, uh, arts advocate from the San Francisco Arts Commission. She'll be followed by presentations by two artists who are not commissioned uh, to work on Treasure Island. They're not working in San Francisco or the Bay Area. We just think that their work is, is, is a key to thinking about how ecological arts might be incorporated. Each of them have a strong environmental and climate change focus in their work. Buster Simpson, based in Seattle, works with ecology, environment, and infrastructure questions and is currently completing work on the Alaskan Way seawall in Seattle. Lauren Bond from Metabolic Studio in Los Angeles will introduce a short video on her project, Bending the River into the City, a three-part project that utilizes LA river water to engage communities with a series of social, environmental, and political issues considering water use in California in the future. Both Buster and Lauren are deeply knowledgeable and tuned to long-term environmental processes. They've dedicated their life practice to pushing aesthetics and gone be way beyond uh, the land art traditions that we sometimes think of when we think of artists uh, working in the landscape to work with create sustainable to create sustainable landscapes that deeply consider the relationship of people, politics, and place. So uh, join me in, in welcoming Jill Manton to give us an overview of the Arts Master Plan. Thank you, Susan. It's great to be here and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, as Susan said, I'm going to give you some background about the Treasure Island Art Program and uh, the Treasure Island Arts Master Plan. And um, it really was a collaborative effort to develop the master plan with participation from the Arts Commission, Treasure Island Development Authority, the development team, Kevin Conger and his firm were partners and the multiple design teams that are designing uh, different parts of the island. The program is funded by 1% for art and private development, which over the 20 year um, development project should generate around $50 million. Um, what, what's important to note that originally all of the um, percent for art funding was going to be private art that was going to be placed on private property. And in it, I think in an act of incredible civic largesse, the developer agreed to repurpose the funding to spend it exclusively to benefit and enhance the public realm. You heard um, both Faye and Kevin mention that we have 300 acres of accessible um, open space and what what better place to um, to develop an art program? So quite simply, our vision is to make Treasure Island a destination for the arts. We see it as an unparalleled opportunity to commission bold, imaginative, forward-thinking contemporary art, uh, permanent and temporary in all media, including in the future an artist in residence program and environmental artworks. And that's the obvious link to this program. We're really at the very inception of the art program right now. We've commissioned one work, which um, will hopefully be installed in 2022. It's for the top of Yerba Buena Island. And it's a, a 60 foot tower sculpture by the artist Hiroshi Sugimoto. And it's actually quite spectacular. I wanted to share with you the framework that's guiding the development of the um, the art program. So we ask artists to use, and here this is a, 
an image from one of our brainstorming workshops with all of the design teams where we identified different sites around the island for uh, different kinds of artwork. And a lot of those ideas actually found, them, found their way into the arts master plan. Um, so the curatorial framework um, asks artists to use the name of the island as a source of inspiration. I, I've always been intrigued by an island in the middle of the bay called Treasure Island. To consider the island's unique vantage point in the middle of the bay amidst the Bay Bridge, the Vista of San Francisco, the East Bay, um, we want them artists to think about the notion of art on the edge and where the land meets the sea. And then um, we ask artists to um, honor the place, its histories and stories. And we hope that the artworks will showcase the same spirit of innovation, optimism and invention that characterized the Golden Gate International Expo in 1939. And then of course, um, you know, with the link to tonight's program, we want artists to address and examine Treasure Island's ecology and the unique environment, its unique environmental conditions. And then we um, are also committed to featuring projects by local artists, national artists, and international artists. So that is my, my brief um, statement tonight. I want to thank my colleagues at the Exploratorium for producing the show and all of the speakers who've joined us. And thank you for attending. Hello. Um... Well, uh, there are some similarities to uh, the Barcadero and uh, the uh, what's dri driven the, probably the biggest uh, infrastructure project in Seattle, and that's the um, Last Way Viaduct demolition, uh, and it impacted a number of different aspects. Uh, and I happen to be working on as a community artist on. Uh, a couple of others and as a commission artist on one, which I'm trying to tie together, um, uh, you know, in this um, day and age, it's, you know, you've got to get, you got to get to the issues pretty fast. Um, uh, the whole climate changes we've seen uh, is, is um, um, uh, paramount, obviously. Uh, here we have on the left, uh, man with head in sand, uh, perhaps a humble cell portrait. And on the right, that uh, sandbag uh, deployed in Washington, D.C. around an intake of a metro uh, station. Next image. Uh, uh, when they decided to build the large tunnel that uh, made the old Highway 99 obsolete, which is part of the Alaskan Way and Alaskan Way Viaduct, uh, there's, the, there's the Battery Street Tunnel that runs through Belltown. Six blocks of uh, very expensive real estate in one of the highest dense neighborhoods in Seattle. A number of us got together when we heard that it was going to be basically landfilled and for two years put together with, uh, with a pretty large community team, a vision for how it could be repurposed. Uh, this neighborhood on all the uh, north-south uh, um, avenues is the main trunk lines for a lot of um, uh, uh, infrastructure, including black water, gray water, storm water, and potable water, and electrical. All of those lines run over what we proposed would be the de-skinning of the uh, uh, Battery Street Tunnel, which was basically a, a cut and cover tunnel that uh, uh, ran through this, this neighborhood. Open it up. Uh, uh, allow all of that water to be um, either repurposed or processed through uh, black water machines, gray water machines. The technology is there. And to reuse it. Uh, Seattle, like everywhere else, is facing major uh, summer droughts and uh, hotter climate. And 
uh, more uh, uh, frequent uh, rains in the winter time. So capacity needs to be increased and uh, and and cisterns to to, to uh, dole out the water uh, so that the fish get part of the deal here. Uh, next image. Uh, further down from uh, the Alaskan Way Viaduct, which the Battery Street Tunnel connected to, is uh, the second major project going on in Seattle where I was in a competition and shortlisted looking at the, uh, the uh, surface and uh, roof watershed of a large development that uh, is part of the hill, time, hill climb corridor from the public market uh, down to the waterfront. And I did not hear talk at the time about uh, redirecting, gathering and redirecting that water to then feed the, uh, the waterfront. Uh, there we have a couple of young folks uh, pumping some of that water for their food garden. Um, ex part of my concern is, is that we internalize a lot of, uh, a lot of the uh, infrastructure uh, that needs to be more accessible. We're not ready for gray water uh, and black water repurposing yet, but uh, all architecture needs to be plumbed so that it's easily accessible to get a hold of that water. Uh, next image. Um, this is the uh, seven foot projection uh, in possibly a, a hundred years or more. Uh, my project site, which is right in the center there, uh, is going to be underwater. So that calls into question what to do. Next image. Well, what to do was a hint uh, of what I did on another project. This is... Um, the uh, Army Corps of Engineer uh, building along the Duwamish River, which flows into uh, uh, Elliott Bay, um, the uh, and the and right along Alaskan Way. So the salmon that migrate from uh, uh, Puget Sound, which we now call the Salish Sea, up this up the uh, uh, Duwamish, uh, pass by this. Uh, building, which has been shaped to look like a um, oxbow. Um, ironically, the Army Corps years ago straightened out this uh, the the, the uh, uh, river so that uh, for for commerce, and uh, so all the oxbows were uh, were straightened out. Um, uh, uh, you'll notice down along the water's edge, there's some uh, root wads. Um, next image, please. So uh, I've been uh, working on these uh, dolos on the left here as a form of anchor. Um, often we see when, uh, when uh, they do uh, shoreline um, root wad placement, they hide the anchors, and that is almost as, that is, I find that disingenuous, just like I find um, that we, we don't expose downspouts off from roof watersheds, and, and instead we internalize all of that, uh, instead of, you know, the saying that a building is a machine. On the right is uh, uh, what they call uh, armor, uh, and we're seeing increasingly more of this armor um, um, as seawalls around the world. Uh, next image. So uh, the uh, commander came up to me, the Army Corps of Engineers, and said he had a problem. They couldn't, uh, uh, they couldn't, I, I complimented on the fact that I saw the uh, root wads along the shoreline but the Corps could not get their permit together. Ironically, they're the, they're the permitting agency for, uh, for uh, a shoreline uh, engagement. So I suggested that in the meantime, we could, uh, in the parade grounds uh, below his viewpoint, which we see there on the left, uh, I put a battalion um, uh, or a brigade, actually, of... Um, of uh, 
of uh, dolos, um, anthropomorphic dolos uh, they've become, um, that are hugging these root wads. And at uh, such a time, next image, that uh, they, uh, they get their permit, we can, um, we can deploy the uh, root wads down to their intended place, uh, along with the, uh, the anchors that are very conspicuously doing their job of having this dance between uh, weight and the buoyancy of the wood, at least implied uh, uh, dance. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the General Service Administration that, in, uh, that, that um, uh, runs the Art in Architecture Program, which was my commissioning uh, agency, uh, did not like the idea of uh, art moving off from the pedestal, so to speak. So that project didn't happen. I went on to Plan B, and the colonel to this day has not, uh, or the commander has not got his um, root wads along the river. Next image, please. Uh, here is the uh, Alaskan Way viaduct. Uh, it is now gone, totally. Uh, and down at the very extreme right, you see the location where um, um, I'm proposing uh, the Anthropocene migration stage. When I use the word stage, I think of it as a theatrical stage, but it's also a stage like stage one, stage two, stage three. And that's where the migration comes in. It's a strategy to deal with uh, rising seawaters. Next image, please. <coughs> So this is the uh, this is that location um, uh, uh, around the turn of the century. Uh, you can see a lot of First Nation canoes uh, um, uh, tied up, uh, as well as a lot of spectators. I'm not really sure of the event. Um, next slide. Uh, and then this is that same location, only looking uh, today. Uh, so one view on the left. We have two of the columns that um, I have uh, particularly uh, fancy that's right across from the site. I would have loved to have had them saved. Uh, in a sense, they, uh, they were right at the pinch point of when the, um, uh, the earth and squally earthquake caused the, uh, the beginning of the fear that the whole uh, structure built very much like the, uh, the viaduct in uh, Oakland that did pancake on itself. Uh, so there was a ticking time bomb going on here that, uh, that uh, they uh, needed to address immediately. And so there's an exoskeleton, an interesting exoskeleton on these columns. Um, I had the uh, engineer who did the study for all of this look at the uh, if they could, if we could save these two columns, he said that they could, they could stand alone. They had the structural integrity. So I saw them as an icon. Um, so that's that. And then and here's the view from uh, on the other side of the water on the right, uh, looking back at the, at the, at the site for the stages. Uh, next image. Um, so as you, on the left, you see in the background the totems uh, of the uh, remaining um, uh, uh, columns, so I wish. Uh, it became political. Um, and uh, so uh, plan B on that one. Uh, in the foreground, though, you see uh, the dolos. They were moving ahead with the dolos and also a series of of uh, sandbags that are, continue to evolve, uh, considering this project started in 2013, um, uh, and not uh, two decades as Kevin <laughs> has been working on. Um, and then on the right, you see kind of a plan view in details. And, you know, this is just a sample of, of uh, master planning, uh, of presenting the ideas, and you see the opportunities. And it's, a, it's basically a scouting thing, this schematic design of ideas that uh, bubble up that you think are important. Um, 
and and uh, all of these projects are on my website if you want to really dive into it. Next image, please. Uh, detail of the dolos. Uh, I love the fact that the kids, the idea that the kids are going to be uh, playing on these. These are the youngins that uh, uh, someday are going to be um, uh, using our name in vain, quite frankly, for the havoc we've caused them. Um, so they may uh, say that, you know, these could really be anchoring down those root wads uh, and all that other stuff that's floating around. We're going to have to move them up, up, uh, up land a little bit, maybe, maybe not. And you see the sandbags in the background there as well. Next image. Um, so, you know, we've got uh, sea rise and a lot more uh, root wads falling in for, uh, as the uh, shoreline erodes away. Um, and there's this kind of, again, um, sculptural quality of these uh, a very honest uh, um, approach to holding these, uh, uh, this biomass in place. Uh, it, it is uh, intended to, as uh, um, migration um, um, and habitat for the salmon, uh, migration support. Next image. Um, and here's a schematic of, uh, uh, you know, the progression, the stages uh, and beyond. Next image. Um, in the foreground, um, I'll uh, note there's uh, uh, that pattern and you, you see in the sidewalk are glass blocks. And I think that uh, this is probably the strongest uh, uh, aspect of what uh, the civil engineering has accomplished for the seawall. And that is the fact that uh, migrating salmon, young salmon, um, like to hug along the shore but they do not in the case of urban uh, places because of the finger piers that shade um, the water, which uh, is not where the salmon prefer to go. So this promenade has a, a glass walkway uh, the entire length that uh, becomes the corridor for the migration that is both going up the Duwamish and back out to sea again. Um, Next image, please. So this was uh, basically the early idea. And, you know, the strategy often uh, is we get a placeholder out there of something that uh, we want to, like, uh, uh, kind of mark as uh, an interest, uh, but yet keep working on it. And, of course, with uh, uh, close to, uh, uh, you know, 10 years of thinking about this project, uh, it, it would evolve. You'll see underneath uh, at the base of the sandbags, which come in units uh, six foot long, um, that there's a uh, 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 connections for uh, uh, forklifting. Um, I really look at these almost like uh, our form of the Jersey barrier. They're very mobile and usable, and and that's the intent. Um, next image. So I'm playing now uh, with uh, some uh, additional forms, more of a contemporary uh, sandbag, which really have become bladder bags, really. That's what uh, the whole East Coast is using to protect their shoreline. Very large bladders, although as these are scaled down to have that human scale of a sandbag. Uh, and also have animated them a bit. Um, um, and um, uh, they will be cast. Uh, and uh, and in units so that they uh, can be moved around. Okay, next image. Uh, and they kind of mimic this uh, 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 kind of off-the-shelf idea of uh, habitat for the migrating salmon that have been put all along the the wall, the seawall, um, as a as a uh, providing habitat and a uh, grab hold for different types of uh, marine biology. Next image. Um, play around with the idea of, uh, of uh, 
the accretion of uh, Salish bags, getting woven Salish bags, in this case, stainless steel uh, weaving, um, and to create these baskets uh, uh, that, that, uh, that become a, a, a accretion habitat uh, environments to in, enhance even more the, uh, the beach uh, that is intended to be um, uh, conducive to the salmon, migrating salmon's needs. Next image. Um, early on when I learned that the, uh, uh, the, the uh, columns for the Alaskan viaduct were, were uh, had the, the capacity to stand up by themselves, um, I wondered, well, uh, do they really need to remove the footing that's below grade? Why don't they leave that footing um, um, for, you know, the eventuality, um, I will be the pessimist, the eventuality that uh, this may be needed for the next uh, infrastructure project. Um, and... Uh, 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 and, you know, ideas like that are kind of like more like speculation and throwing it out to a bunch of engineers. I love to get response. Um, so here's the, the um, columns, um, uh, iconic tomatic, uh, uh, totems of, uh, uh, that unfortunately we've lost. They, that, uh, that, that would have given people a sense of scale of, of the uh, of viaduct. Uh, next image. Um, and the romantic notion that in lieu of the colonnade of uh, London Plain that will be planted all along the waterfront, we have down in the historic district where the First Nation um, uh, peoples lived. Um, uh, a uh, red cedar and a, uh, um, uh, uh, a magnolia, uh, a, 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 a magnolia, uh, not a magnolia, a madrona, sorry. Um, and um, uh, here's a little um, um, farewell, um, uh, welcome, welcome figure um, at the Fry Art Museum. Uh, called Secure Embrace with a red cedar root wad. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for including uh, me in this talk today. Um, on the subject of Treasure Island, my thoughts are if all 300 acres of land that are allocated to habitat on Treasure Island were committed to the regeneration of topsoil, then we could be reframing the term treasure on this island for the future we're in the midst of encountering. One in which the largest and greatest ocean in the world, the Pacific, is dying as a result of the toxification released in Fukushima and the radioactive legacy of Treasure Island itself has played a part. Uh, Metabolic Studio is committed to strategies in which artists create on the scale that society has the capacity to destroy. And a project like this, I think, really needs to think in an accountable way for the disappearing topsoil that is part of the legacy of agriculture and radioactive legacy, which is part of the ocean. So with that, I'd like, um, uh, Kale, if you wouldn't mind starting the video, um, that would be great.
Metabolic Studio is looking at facing the peril of the sixth mass extinction. We're entering a period where art production needs to give back to Mother Earth. So the Metabolic Studio was formed to really think about how can we as artists catalyze living systems and create a network of exchanges that follow from that engagement. The life web in Los Angeles is struggling to get enough water and the LA River is moving wastewater very quickly out to sea. Wouldn't it be good if lots of locations could have LA River water that weren't adjacent to the LA River? Portable wetland takes the attributes of a wetland and distributes it throughout the city where there may not even be anything remotely that looks like nature. What's really unique about the portable wetland is its ability to clean water, but expire oxygen. Each of these boxes is full of volcanic scoria, which is small little rocks that have been delivered to us from the Owens Valley. So when you fill a big tub like this full of LA River plants, then the root systems want to travel down in the boxes and they travel round those pieces of scoria and they create something like a fibrous web. And it's that web that when you put water in, cleans the water. What we're really looking at is, is it possible to support the unhoused community with portable wetlands so that they would have a water source where they could grow food or wash their clothes that wouldn't make them ill? And would the air quality be better in those really tough urban areas? With that in mind, you could place this up and down the 51 miles of LA River Channel pretty easily. So it's really looking at a systemic adaptation, which is a hoped for parallel narrative to LA River revitalization. This project is part of a long inquiry by Metabolic Studio and I, this idea of bending the river back into the city. If you're throwing this water away, why wouldn't you pick some small portion of it up, cleanse it, and give it back to the floodplain? It's actually a piece of civil engineering disguised as an artwork. And it's disguised as an artwork because that was the only way to get it permitted. Once I was able to get far enough along in the permitting process, the LADWP informed me that when I lift water out of the LA River, salvaging wastewater, I would still need to pay the city for the water I salvaged in order to give it away to parks for free. That would be a problem in its replication. Not a lot of people can do the work of lifting salvaged water, cleanse it, and then pay the city to distribute it. So they said the only other way to go would be to get a private water right. I was granted a water right to 106 acre feet of water per year for what's called beneficial purposes. I have the first private water right in the city of Los Angeles. So it really is at its root core a conceptual work about precedent setting who can actually sit through what it takes to shift the paradigm in some small way, to check the box other on the application as not a developer, not a park builder, not a politician, uh, but rather an artist, has been an innovative strategy to get a piece of adaptive reuse of civil engineering made. Metabolic Studio decided that as part of our portfolio of community engagement, that the stabilization of people who currently live in and around the LA River, most specifically in Lincoln Heights, was of grave importance to us. Water from my water right will be networked, not just to the 32 acre state park, but we have a pipe embedded in the Spring Street Bridge, which will move water from our wetland to this site, as well as Albion Park next door. We're on Metabolic's Undevelopment One site, and by undevelopment, what we mean is that we're taking a place that had some properties of the moon, namely inert, incapable of supporting 
living systems as we know it and looking at what it would take to cajole it back into being a floodplain. We're trying to see what 100 acre feet of wastewater distributed on 40 acres of industrial corridor can do for a multitude of living systems. Our sculptural projects are things like the six circles on the moon that have been allowed over a three year period to rebound, letting light and seed reconnect and adding um, cleansed water from our portable wetland. I hoped that we could reconnect with the floodplain just by removing six study circles, all of the same size on this site. We realized that all six circles were full of completely different soil, <laughs> brought in from different landfills, and all six of them behave differently. We're trying to analyze um, what can be done on construction sites so that we don't create giant piles of concrete somewhere else. Now entering our fourth year, we're absolutely amazed at how vital this place is and all kinds of living creatures are thriving here. We're well on our way to thinking about what a food forest could look like on this property sometime in the distant future. Metabolic Studios Farm Lab has been looking at how do we keep living systems alive since 2006. Most of the people in Farm Lab are from District 1 or Northeast LA to whoever wants to come to help build soil and detoxify water and learn how to make medicine from the plants you see growing around you. We all uh, are interested in seeing if we can allow this land to reintegrate its primary purpose to support living systems. We're all here in a way to give back to Mother Earth um, and to pass on that knowledge to the next generations. How do we as private citizens and as artists create demonstration projects that will actually live past political time, four to eight years, to make our cities uh, breathing spaces for all living systems? So thank you so much to the artists and to Jill for giving us a perspective um, on how the arts master plan might work. I want to remind people again that these two artists are not commissioned with Treasure Island. I think it might be even tonight be the first time they've even seen the plan. So I, I have a, one question which comes to mind, especially looking at uh, both of the artists work that I want to kind of ask uh, Faye and Kevin. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested in this idea of infrastructure and how both of their projects really try to make infrastructure visible. We uh, at the Exploratorium will be working with the Port of San Francisco as an education partner as they start thinking about the Embarcadero seawall and uh, renovations to it. And we've learned that people don't think of infrastructure really as part of their lives. It's, it's really kind of a commons. It connects us all. We use it all the time. And even if you don't live on a waterfront, or you don't live near a park, you still use those systems every day. So I was sort of wondering with, uh, for Faye and Kevin, with um, in, you know all the transformations that you'll be doing uh, on Treasure Island, is there a way that you could think of engaging making the infrastructure more visible? Is there a way that artists could help in some way really think of those structures for the long term? How can people become more aware of the systems that are holding our society together? Faye, would you like to jump in first? Yes, well, um, I, I think that's a very intriguing question of how we might incorporate artists in the infrastructure that is being um, built on the island and, and there is quite a bit of infrastructure, certainly the new roads, um, but there's also wastewater treatment plants. They are um, water, new water tanks 
that are being built um, to serve the residents who will live on the island. And I've always thought that um, artists could be incorporated, even if it's simply um, decorating, um, painting uh, on, on the walls of the water tank, or maybe there's some other way to engage artists in the wastewater system um, uh, in infrastructure. So those, those are some things. And I, I think this is the exact reason why we are engaging conversations with artists is to find ways that we can incorporate their um, inquiry and their thoughts into what we're doing at Treasure Island. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think um, well, one of the things that's really interesting about Treasure Island is the scale. And uh, there is a large scale, it's infrastructural scale. It has its own wastewater treatment plant. It has, you know, it ha it, with, the, with the food production um, and, and, um, and that, that infrastructure applies to the natural systems as well. There's sort of a, a, a scalable natural infrastructure that is possible with the creation of habitat and the creation of wetlands and the um, relationship to the bay around sea level rise and those things. And I think the potential, I mean, you're exactly right, Susan, what artists do is make it visible, but it's not just to make it visible, it's to be provocative, to make people think about what it is, how it works, and what is our relationship as a being that is largely moving around, changing the natural environment to suit our own needs? What are the impacts of those changes that we're making? And that's where I think Buster and Lauren's work is just so um, compelling and many other artists because it makes you stop and think like, what are we doing? And what are all the impacts of these um, modifications that we are continually making to the land? I'd like to pull uh, Lauren or, or Buster uh, in, in terms of Lauren, how long have you been evolving this project? I really loved your comment about uh, having a project that works beyond political time, four to eight years. And so when we think of Treasure Island going on for the next 50 years or so, I, I don't know what the time scale is. I wonder, Lauren, if you have some thoughts about just the, the, the politics and the community relations that one needs to engage to do a long-term infrastructure project like you're working on? Well, um, first of all, I think that we need to be thinking about geological time here um, at this point. So political time is um, a very optimistic, <laughs> has a very optimistic spin on it because it's assuming that there's going to be 50 years from now um, something that resembles contemporary politics, which I think is highly unlikely. Um, but in terms of um, infrastructure, remember that we're all of us here today speaking um, in a place that is absolutely 100% connected by a hydraulic entity. All of our water and power is completely um, connected by um, harnessing um, the snow cap from the Sierra and the Rockies. So the entire Intermountain West is one hydraulic system that is managed by federal, state, and local governments. And um, the reason that we are in that um, situation is because we decided um, in the 19th century um, to um, try and become an international um, trade empire and be able to imagine trading with Asia through the, through the Pacific. So we're inheriting a very complicated system that, um, sorry, I've got, I'm sharing the stage with my dogs at the moment. Um, uh, we're inheriting a very um, um, ancient strategy for empire that the Romans used, you know, to basically move water where you want it to go. So I think that, that I think we're about to move into a place where we need to kind of go farther. We need to go to the, the next step and think about how we can put systems into operations that will go past political time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On that geological time scale, Buster, do you have a, I mean, you've worked along that realm for so long. You're, you, you know, 40 years worth of engaging ecological ideas on that realm. Uh, well, I'd like to, uh, um, uh, for uh, uh, Faye, uh, 
uh, cite uh, the Brightwater Project as something to look into. It's the, the King County wastewater plant um, that was built uh, probably uh, well, uh, 10 years ago. Um, and the, the artists were on, involved with that from the very beginning. Um, uh, in fact, uh, the artist created a master plan that's, that's available. Um, and, and for culture, which is a public art entity, and, and basically for the Northwest, our, our um, patron. Um, and uh, I, I would speak to uh, the importance of having an enlightened um, civil servant, uh, engineering, um, uh, people in public practice that, uh, that um, have a, 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 a working relationship with artists so that uh, these uh, uh, issues that Lauren brings up about the four or eight year political turnaround can be avoided, although it's, it is very difficult. It's, it's the only way that you, we're going to be able to pull this off. You can't rely on patronage of the private sector necessarily for this unless they're incredibly enlightened. Uh, there's another interesting project that's uh, come about uh, in Portland. Portland's got a lot of black water machines. Some of them are organic. Some of them are all machine, which I don't care for that much. Um, uh, the Lloyd Center it would be an interesting uh, place to check out where it's all exposed. It's downtown. It's all an exposed outdoor part of the landscape. So it's part of, instead of uh, relegated off into a corner somewhere. Um, um, and, um, you know, that's, that, that might be a good start for some uh, case studies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, on that question, Kevin and Faye, is the, you know, I know that soon uh, the, the island is going to be raised. Uh, new soils are going to be brought in and uh, we're raising the levels. And I'm wondering, again, this idea of uh, uh, that, that uh, Lauren made me think about in terms of demonstration projects, is there a way to integrate an artist during that process that allows us to test some ideas uh, rather than just build what we've already designed? Is there a way to test them through uh, pilot projects that we might explore over a period of time and then evolve further as we see what really works or what doesn't work. Is there a sense that uh, sometimes in public art, artists come in at the last, they're the last phase. They, uh, they're, they're put onto projects that are, have already been designed and they don't really have a voice in where those projects might go or how they might evolve. So I wonder if there's a role there as we're evolving, um, as we're really getting started with Treasure Island and some of the interesting sea level rise questions. I would uh, say absolutely, I, Faith, yeah, I'll follow absolutely. you. Absolutely, yes, no. We, we are so much interested in bringing artists um, and their perspectives um, into what we're doing at Treasure Island. And certainly pilot projects are ways to do that. Um, I, I think we would need the ideas first. Um, much of the geotechnical work and the earth moving work has been done for at least the first phase. Um, of the project. And actually that geotechnical work was just um, something that was very um, almost uh, revolutionary in that it was, it's, it's only been tried in, in few places, um, but um, it, it is quite amazing what they have done so far. Um, but there are other phases to the island. This, this island is going to take, it's going to take 30 years um, to build out over time. And so I think that there's ways to incorporate pilot projects um, and to see how they might work and how we can, how we can coordinate and collaborate with artists. Yeah. Well, can I expand on that? Susan? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Please. You know, I would say, you know, first of all, to underscore that, that all of Treasure Island is a, is a huge experiment. It is an experiment in whether people are going to be willing to move into a place that is not particularly car friendly, friendly that's primarily set up for pedestrians and bicycles. And while there are some streets and places to park, it's not going to be the most convenient place to live if you need to drive everywhere. 
Um, it, you know, it's, there's a huge experiment in the habitat management plan. There's huge experiments going on in the recycling and repurposing of materials that are on site. And of course, the sea level rise adaptation plan was far ahead of its time that we developed in partnership with BCDC. And I think the notion of, of flooding the northern end of the island to create future wetlands is, is quite experimental. The question is, is there a place for artists to come in and participate in this experimentation in the ongoing um, development of it? And, and that has already happened in the past with some of the commissions that have been uh, in place. And I would say, yes, there's a series of developments that are in are approvals that are in place for the island. And they get more and more constrained as those phases of the project get closer and closer to being realized. But those phases of the project that are a long ways out, like this entire northern end, are are notional and programmatic at this point. Mm -hmm. And we don't have designs for these um, landscapes yet. Some mm -hmm. things are in place, like where the housing is and how much housing there will be and how much affordable housing there will be and those things. But there's there's so much room for new partnerships and new experimentation and um, new ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jill, do you want to talk at all about um, how you're seeing uh, the, this, these kind of artists that have a longer term perspective being integrated um, into, into the program that might be co-thinkers with Kevin, perhaps, and the, that, that northern edge that we still don't know what the design is or how it will really work? Yes, well, actually, I think um, it would be a good time to start to bring artists in to learn about uh, the, the northern part of the island or the part that Kevin has referred to as the wilds, because I don't think ideas, you know, I don't think it's something like you go back to your studio and you come up with a sketch for a sculpture. I think it's a process of learning and thinking and um, it might take time, but as Kevin said, right now those areas are just programmatic and they have, they're not at 35% design or 60% design. And I think, and, and um, my experience um, on some projects I've worked on in San Francisco is that these ideas can just take a while to develop and then to gain the permissions and then to get the approval. So I, I would love to encourage um, Treasure Island to commission an artist to sort of start that dialogue that will evolve over time, and um, I, I, you know, I think the time is now, and I, I, I think it would be a great complement to what we're doing while we launch the program with large-scale sculpture. I think at the same time, showing a commitment to the environmental art um, would be, you know, would be wonderful and timely. Mm -hmm. We have a question here that's, um, you know, maybe I'll even pull, pull Jessica in, who I know is working on the Bay Adapt plan, the BCDC plan that's um, really just setting up the principles for how we think about how we'll make decisions. And here's a question about what are some of the partnership conditions needed for artists to facilitate complex ecological works, particularly projects spanning 10 to 15 years? Like, could there be residencies where people come in and out for that long of a period? And I don't know, it, with the Bay Adapt, you're trying to bring in more and more thinkers, but is there any room for artists in that planning? I love that. Um, you know, I think I said in, in the beginning that um, while this is certainly going to require lots of physical solutions at the core, this is really a human challenge. How do we work together? How do we overcome these governance barriers that we have. And so um, I think in addition to artists helping us think through some of the physical dimensions of it, it would be wonderful to have some thinkers who could join in thinking about how do we actually work together as a community of disparate people all gathered around one bay to, um, to collaborate. So sure. <laughs> yeah. And maybe for Buster and, and Lauren, you know, what is the, you know, um, how do artists work across bureaucracy to do their work? Um, well, I, <laughs> I have a I have a couple of uh, quick suggestions. Um, if if I were working on uh, the Treasure Island project and I were imagining a ten or fifteen year period of agency, um, I would start by getting involved with the all of the bureaus of sanitation on all of the municipalities that are all the way around the bay um, because, um, because um, again, I'm prioritizing the idea of topsoil generation as what I think uh, the new form of treasure would be on this island. 
Um, so I would, I think the Bureau of Sanitation uh, here in, in Los Angeles, at least, is the most innovative of the city departments in terms of strategizing um, about sanitation and what um, compromises the future. Um, I would also look into the agencies um, that are dealing with the forest fires all the way around California. Um, we're currently pulling burnt logs um, out of the San Gabriel Reservoir, um, turning that into um, biochar and mixing that with highly impacted lead landfill to create a kind of hybrid uh, form of mulch that also um, we take compromised water from uh, urban runoff and mix it in with that to form soil and topsoil. So I would say working with the Bureau of Land Management, working with the federal forests um, and working with the sanitation department on a long-term program for regenerating topsoil would, would be what I would suggest. Great. And Buster, any comments from you about working across so many uh, realms to accomplish a project? I, I, it's crucial. I do it all the time. Um, I, I guess I had to sense the place to see what where I would want to um, focus on. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a. I'm not sure, like how much time we've got on this island. That's that's my that's my concern. Uh, <laughs> you know, I maybe we need to bring in some pontoons uh, for for the architecture. Um, but um, or maybe that's the, 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 and I'm sure there's there's been a discussion about that, and I'm in the dark on it. But um, uh, uh, what is the life cycle of this of this island if we do get, um, um, as Jessica mentioned, like uh, you know, uh, eight, nine, seven, eight, nine feet of uh, of water? Um, uh, Kevin, is is the is the levee going to hold back uh, that high of a, of um, uh, given a, a storm surge? Yes. They will. Okay. And that, not initially. It won't be built to that height initially because that's it's not necessary. But but it, the plan, adapts to that level of sea level rise protection. And as uh -huh. I said, there's a there's a funding mechanism in place to actually pay for it and manage it, which is quite unique actually. And it was one of the first projects in the Bay Area to set up this comprehensive approach to sea level rise adaptation. And I think is really now the model for um, much of California's coastal areas. So. Yeah, there's a physical plan on how to do it. There's a there's a financial plan on how to pay for it, and um, you know, in a way, it is going to be much safer and better protected than much of the rest of the San Francisco Bay Area that don't have these yes. um, infrastructures in place. Yes. And uh, and so perhaps there's uh, there's a lot of sandbags you're going to be needing, in a metaphorical kind of way. Well, it's I an ongoing. How... I mean, to the yeah. point of the of the of this whole session today of transitional landscape. Yeah. You know, I think I think the future that we're looking at is not that we're gonna build it and be done when we're anywhere near the water. It's that we're gonna be constantly adapting and adapting for the foreseeable future. And um, and I, we've kind of been doing that anyway. We just haven't acknowledged it as, in such an explicit way. And I think acknowledging that that's what we're doing not just on the water's edge, but but around topsoil, as Lauren is mentioning, around all these other things. I think it's a it's a better and more healthy way to work and and just acknowledge our relationship with um, nature and the land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. I, you know, it's it's like when I look at some landfills. Uh, you know, the one outside of the Denver Airport. It's almost like the Mayan pyramids of uh, of uh, stepped up. You see this progression over time of different increments in its building, which it sounds like that uh, that's going to be a very legible um, aspect to those levees. Um, um, coming not up so out. much, not, not, not so much because the parks are, they're big. They're big. The we so have big? scale. The parks are big. The, the open space edge is quite large. And so we have scale to work with to be able to transition these, you know, so elevated they may be a gradual 
gradual slope up. Yeah, with continued public access, it won't. It's not like they'll be cut off from the water, and you know, um, not to be, um, you know, arrogant about it, Buster. But we've thought this through. <laughs> Lauren, were you going to make a comment? Well, I'm, I'm very excited about um, this idea of accretion that um, Buster brought up in, in his um, presentation. And um, th there was a patent that I put on the chat bar before I managed to shut myself out of it altogether. But um, there, there's been, over the last 30 years, a lot of thinking about how to use saline uh, ocean water or salt water uh, with a positive and a negative charge from the sun to, uh, on a metal mesh to accrete something very light coral onto a, a mesh. And it's, uh, it's being explored in New Orleans and other um, places where erosion is a big issue. But it seems to me that uh, with all of the construction that you're going to be doing, that doing some testing on these um, ideas where you can constantly have the fact that you have salt water and sunlight um, be used to accrete something very like uh, uh, jetties um, uh, uh, would be an interesting thing. And, and again, it's it's been patented, this method called accretion. Um, and I've played with it a little, but not not to uh, any structural success. But I think that, that getting involved with um, sort of universities that um, are looking at um, the future of building materials um, would be very interesting on this project also so that you can perhaps, again, be thinking about what kinds of construction processes can self um, rebuild um, using salt, using sunlight, um, and using, um, you know, metabolism. <laughs> And, and I think that that's the sort of conversation that marries art and science and natural processes and, and actually um, makes us think differently um, and more creatively. So those are the types of things that I think are very fascinating and that we should look into. Yes. Well, thank you all. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, this is just the kind of conversation I hope we could see. It seems really very rich. Thank you so much. And again, we're really interested in ways that artists, educators, the general public, uh, our communities can work together to envision our future landscape. So thank you all so very much for engaging with us tonight. And our audience, please stay tuned. We hope to have more events like this. And uh, we look forward to getting that symposium going so that we can continue uh, the conversation. Thank you so much tonight. And um, thank you. Okay. Great. Nice to see you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.